indisputable king of swing. Benny Goodman was a dichotomous character, constantly full of contradictions. Raised in the pitiless slums of the Maxwell Street District in Chicago with 11 siblings, music was the only escape he had from the ghetto. He joined a band featuring Big Spiderbeck in 1923 at only 14. His dad, whom he adored, was killed in a streetcar accident in 1926. He left for New York shortly thereafter, determined to make success and provide for his family. Success However, was hard in coming as Goodman played as a radio sideman in the orchestra for Broadway shows and as a studio player. He also had a late night radio show which gathered him a small but loyal audience, largely in the second cities outside New York. But consistent success evaded Goodman until he put out one of the most influential records ever. The King Porter Stomp. An appearance at the Stanley Theatre in Pittsburgh brought dancing in the aisles from fans of his radio show and the irrepressibly swinging music that he played there. But it wasn't until his tour reached Oakland in California that the music caused a near riot with the jitterbugging and balboaing and whatnot. However, Goodman was crushed the next night when the audience at Pisno Beach was disdainful, suffering a severe lack of confidence before an important series of gigs at the Palomar Ballroom in Los Angeles. He played his first set using his standard arrangement to borderline antipathy. At the interval between sets, Gene Krupa rallied the troops with a stirring exhortation, we're going to die, Ben, let's die playing our own stuff. Goodman switched to the arrangements that Fletcher Henderson had written for him and went out and slayed them in their seats in as much as they stayed in their seats before they leapt up and started wildly cavorting in the aisles. Swing had arrived as America's music. Even as the swing era began to fade, some say that Goodman's 1938 concerts at Carnegie Hall was the event that put jazz firmly on America's cultural roadmap. But there was more to Goodman than just swing. He was passionately determined not to let Jim Crow stop him from hiring the best musicians for his band. His band was the fourth jazz band to be integrated. Jimmy Durante's was the first back in 1920. He gave a start to Lionel Hampton, Charlie Christian, Teddy Wilson, and many others. When asked by a musician what it was like to play with the word you can't say on YouTube, Goodman told the blackguard that if he ever used that word in his presence again, he'd bust a clarinet over his head. As swing declined and Goodman's attempts to move to bebop came to nothing, he began to pursue an increasing interest in classical music, and he was working until he died in his sleep in 1986. New Jerseyan Bill Count Basie led a varied career as a sideman and occasional band leader from 1920, never finding a pronounced or consistent level of success. By the turn of the 30s, he found himself playing in the band of Benny Moten, playing a primordial R&B style. It was here where he first became known as Count Basie. Moten, like so many band leaders in the 20s and 30s, had a great ear for talent that was a rotten businessman. So much so that in Moten's case his own band voted him out in 1932 and appointed Basie the leader. The band was still foundering despite the addition of the great Ben Webster on sax and it folded after a few months. Basie went back to Moten's band until Moten died from a botched tonsillectomy. Basie then put together his own nine-piece band, including such future legends as bassist Walter Page, Joe Jones, the drummer who supposedly changed the course of jazz by tossing a cymbal onto the stage in front of a floundering Charlie Parker in Kansas City in the early 40s, the great guitarist Freddie Green, the tenorman they call the Prez, Lester Young, and the bluesy vocalist Jimmy Rushing. Playing a blues-based, hard-riffing style, Basie spent the final years of the 30s burning down dance floors across the country. With the end of the big band and the rise of bebop, 
Basie experimented with smaller combos before bringing his big band back in the 60s and becoming a beloved institution on the world stage. Basie died of pancreatic cancer in 1984. Over the span of a long and fruitful career, Coleman Hawkins authored two major changes to the history of jazz. Firstly, he was the first virtuoso saxophonist. Previous to Hawkins, sax players basically used the same technique as clarinetists, but with Mamie Smith's Jazz Hounds and later in Fletcher Henderson's group, he developed a rich and robust tone and soon added an adventurous approach towards soloing after working with Louis Armstrong in Henderson's band. In 1934, he left for Europe and spent five years based in London, touring the continent with Jack Hilton's orchestra before returning in 1939 and establishing himself once again as a top tenor man alongside Lester Young and Ben Webster. In October 1939, he recorded the standard Body and Soul, playing a rich, and mellifluous tone, Hawkins discards the melody after four bars and begins to improvise on the chords much the same way that the beboppers would in 1944. Hawkins enjoyed many more productive years as a revered musician. Lester Young said the hawk was better than him and Miles Davis says he learned how to play ballads by listening to Hawkins. In the early 1960s, Hawkins was busier than ever. The terrible depression overcame him. And by 1969, he drunk himself to death. In my and some others' opinions, the greatest tenor man ever was Lester Young. Coltrane had the technique and the fearless vision. Coleman Hawkins played with that famous full and velvety tone. But young solos were like butterflies full of invention and emotional openness, and best when paired with a vocalist. Despite finding fame with Count Basie, he never really liked playing in large ensemblists, preferring more intimate settings, his partnership with Billie Holiday, of course, being legendary. Young was born in Mississippi in 1909, but grew up in New Orleans. His father and brother, both gifted musicians and Young played with them on the carnival circuit until 1927. From then to 1933 he played in various bands before he hooked up with Count Basie where he stayed apart from a brief spell with Fletcher Henderson until 1940. He also made groundbreaking records with Billie Holiday between 1937 and 1941. He was drafted in 1944 and almost immediately caught martialed, spending a harrowing year in the Huskow, which left him a broken man. Ironically, his emergence after the war corresponded with a big boost in demand for his records, live appearances and guest slots, and he enjoyed a prolific and fruitful period where he played with an emotional intensity seldom heard in jazz. His drinking brought on by his trauma in the army, was eating away at him. Reunited with Holiday in 1957 for a TV special. Both of them were in piteous physical condition, but rallied to give incredibly moving performances. Young died in March 1959. Holiday followed him to the grave four months later. Belgian guitarist Django Reinhardt was not only the first star of European jazz, but along with Eddie Lang and Count Basie's Freddie Green, a seminal influence on the development of the guitar in popular music. Born in 1910, Reinhard suffered terrible burns in a fire he himself accidentally caused. The conflagration burned the left hand so severely that he permanently lost the use of two fingers. Remarkably, he relearned the guitar in two years, and by 1934 he'd become an established jazz musician in partnership with Stefan Grappelli. They formed the Quintet du Hot Club de France and began to issue sides in a style both outside the current trends of jazz, the 
quintet usually performed as an all-string group, as opposed to the horn-led big bands, yet firmly inside the improvisational parameters of the music. World War II was difficult for Django, being of Romani descent, a race for whom the Nazis had a particularly enthusiastic attitude towards murdering wholesale. He was caught once, but the local SS commander was a jazz-loving Dutchman and let him go. Post-war, he toured the US as a guest of Duke Ellington, which was the only time that he played the electric guitar, and Benny Goodman invited him to join his band, but ultimately he turned him down. In his later years, he became increasingly eccentric and unreliable until he dropped dead in the street from a brain hemorrhage in 1953. Born in Texas in 1916, but raised in Oklahoma City from a young age, Charlie Christian was the first major figure of electric guitar. Not the first, but the first major one. Charlie first began playing guitar in the streets, busking, before making his rep in after-hours jams in the clubs of Oklahoma City's notorious Deep Deuce precinct. Local fame ensued and Charlie was soon touring the Midwest playing in nickel and dime outfits for $2.50 a night, while also jamming with name musicians back in the Deep Deuce, one of whom was pianist Mary Lou Williams. He adopted the electric guitar in 1936 and it was one fateful night in Billings, Montana in 1939 when he got a telegram from the famed talent scout John Hammond summoning him to New York City for an audition. This was done on Mary Lou Williams' recommendation. Hammond then recommended Charlie to Benny Goodman, his brother-in-law, who was putting together a new sextet. Accounts vary as to how Christian got the gig. Some say Goodman always wanted him and eased him into the band by not overhyping him. Others say Goodman hated his playing and his flashy style of hipster dress, and it was Hammond who snuck Christian onto the stage where Goodman, out of spite, called for the most difficult number that his band knew, a song called Rose Room. Christian played a 20-plus verse solo. The version of Rose Room went on for 40 minutes, and by the end of the night, Christian was in the band. Christian defined guitar soloing by moving it away from techniques based on the banjo or the lap steel guitar and learning to play horn-like phrases. Lester Young and Chew Berry were his big influences. Rather than play as part of the comp like Freddie Green did, he would use small staccato phrases, playing much more minimally when he wasn't required to solo. In 1940 and 41, he and Goodman's band won every jazz poll that could have been won. It took time, but the fruit of the tree which Christian planted, eventually saw the guitar take over as the primary lead instrument in jazz. Of much more immediate consequence was his influence on the upcoming bebop movement. His free-flowing and inventive improvisations were a major inspiration to the nascent scene. Unfortunately for Charlie, in the late 1930s, he had contracted tuberculosis and his hectic professional and personal lifestyle only helped to hasten its spread. And he succumbed in March 1942, not yet 26 years old. 